So let's turn now to exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. And as we learned in the liturgy, the word Shema is a reference to that passage out of Deuteronomy, those three passages that relate to the oneness of God and the, 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 the fact that God is the only God that we will serve. And in later times, it became a watchword of Jewish monotheism related to the um, ontology of God. What is God made up of? It, you know, particularly um, as the um, Christianities were being developed in the first century, the Shema took on this new meaning of um, defining God as over and against the incarnation of Jesus as God as well. So that's what it, that's what I mean in my study here, exploring the Shema. All right. So as my tabs are opening up here. I'm going to accelerate this part of my study. Those of you who are with me in live class, I'll probably only give um, this. That should go pretty quickly because I don't need to go really uh, into great detail. Um, but we're in this part of my study. Let me drop down to the very bottom so I can pull up the little chart. We're looking at this little chart that Carm put together, as I mentioned uh, in previous studies. And we're um, now looking at a new section. We've basically finished the Holy Spirit section, and we went quite a bit on the first row there. I spent a lot of time kind of laying the, the framework, the groundwork. But now that I've done that and you understand kind of where I'm going in the format, I can go quickly now through the rest of these uh, week after week and hopefully it won't take as long. Maybe I can email it, do all of this in one week. I'm sorry, all of this in one week. We'll see. If I can get it done in the next 10 or 15 minutes, that would be a great thing. Okay, let's just go through it. So let me kind of give you an overview of where we're going to go and then we'll jump into it. We're going to look at the Father called Creator in Isaiah 64. And then we'll look at the Son called Creator in John and in Colossians. And then we'll look at the Holy Spirit given the same role of creatorship in two passages out of Job. And the, what we're doing is we're, we're allowing the Bible give us the picture of this being known as God. Meaning, if God's qualities can be witnessed by his, his own words, then the conclusions that we can come to, even though we don't have one passage that says Jesus is God or the Holy Spirit is God or something like that, although we have passages that come close, then the conclusion that we can draw through deductively as we brought, bring all the pieces together is that we have one being known as God who is nevertheless com uh, um, complex in his nature. He's complex in his unity. Um, he has aspects about him that we can't quite grasp or fully understand, but we have them demonstrated for us in these different passages. So that's where we're going. So with that, let's turn straight over to Isaiah 64. And what did I say? It's Isaiah 64, 8. Let's scroll down to the verse. It says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. So, it's quite obvious from the context of this passage that Israel, or the prophet speaking, of Israel, speaking on behalf of Israel, is recognizing that God is the one who made them. You are our potter, right? And those the imagery of potter and the work of the hand, right? Someone who does clay or something like that pottery. If we look at the uh, Hebrew, um, some nuggets that jump off the page for me are that... Um, God is the uh, uh, the potter and the work, the umaase, the work of your hands. This is not simply an ideal in the mind of God when we say umaase. It's rooted in the, in the Hebrew word asa. This is a very concrete verb that expresses, um, or noun, depending on which uh, uh, rendering, uh, which part of speech. This is a concrete word that kind of um, conveys the sense of doing or making or performing or action oriented it's 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 something that that produces results that can be that are tangible so we don't have to say that this is some kind of ethereal we are the work of your hand as if, as if this was in the mind of god right it's not just a thought of god it's not something that you couldn't see uh, walking in real life. The fact that it's a work of, the, of God's hand is the fact that his creation is real. It's tangible. That's the point I'm trying to make. So it's not, it, it moves beyond just uh, an idea or a concept or a theory in God's mind. Because God could have a lot of thoughts and we could call those thoughts, you know, things. But unless they actually are brought into reality, then we would never know them except unless the God expressed them on, on paper. In his word but with with man specifically with israel 
I'm sure mankind existed in the mind of God from eons past, but there came a time in history when God took that which was inside of his mind and actually made it. He created it. His hand fashioned it and formed it. That's the point I'm trying to make. So God is the one who does these things, right? Now, I said all that to say, as we move into these other passages, we're going to see how that perhaps it's God's hand's doing these things and creating these things, but as the Bible begins to unroll and unscroll it, unroll the scroll before us, we find out that the other members of the Trinity play their own part in how this thing is brought to into, into being.